because now we're going to start with our very first song. It's called No Longer a Slave. I think it's important for us to know that we are a free country, but we're also free from the penalty of sin because Christ died for us. And all we have to do is accept that free gift of salvation. So let's sing. I'm no longer a slave. favorites because you know we can go through a lot of stuff and there are a lot of people that we may not be their cup of tea and you know we may have fallen we may have had a past but it doesn't matter who we once were it doesn't matter what people say we are or who they think we are what matters is who Jesus says we are and we are his child if we've accepted him as our Lord and Savior and that's all that matters right Amen. So who you say I am, that's important. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost. 
lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, his free. So, Father, it's such a blessing to be in your house this morning, Lord. Father, we just ask as, as the pastor comes front and center, Lord, that you give him boldness, Father. Just put him front and center and let him proudly proclaim the word that you give to him to give to us this morning, Lord. Father, just know we love you and we praise you. We ask all that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, if you go ahead and pull them out, uh, we're going to ultimately be in Philippians, but... I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 5 uh, as we'll start off in Ephesians 5 here this morning. We are celebrating the 4th of July and our independence as a nation. And as we uh, celebrate uh, our freedoms, uh, many of us are really wondering uh, how free uh, are we going to be in the future as we continue to go down this path of uh, just absolute craziness as a nation. Uh, the church as a whole has tremendous apathy towards God, and as a nation, uh, there is just downright hostility towards the things of God. And so it leaves many of us wondering, especially when you see the level of immorality that is absolutely celebrated um, across this nation and how. Very few have a heart uh, for God. And so how do we, how do we engage? How do we, how do we make a difference for God? 
And so what we've been talking for the last several weeks about is that if the church is going to, to make an impact in this culture for Christ, then they have to rediscover what it means to walk in the power of the Spirit. It has to be something that is by God the Holy Spirit. It has to be something done in the power of the Spirit of God. And we can fight, we can argue, we can go and do all these things, but if we do not and are not led by the Spirit of God, then we're not going to make lasting impact for the kingdom of God. And we're going to talk ultimately about what that can look like today for you and I. What it can look like and what it should look like when we're empowered by the Spirit of God. But I want to start off by just um, bringing to your remembrance uh, or bringing to your attention Ephesians 5, 8. It says, for you once, you were once darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. You know, we once were, were in darkness. We were once blinded by the enemy. My prayer, my hope is if you're here today, you know Christ is your Savior. You've passed from death to life, from darkness to the light. And so, as God's children, we're called to walk in the power of the Spirit of God, to walk in the light. Matter of fact, he will say in this very chapter, and you've heard me quote this numerous times over the last month or so, to not be drunk with wine, which is dispensation, but to be filled with the Spirit. There will be many today that will become heavily intoxicated celebrating their independence where in all reality many of them are very much dependent and slaves upon the things of this world instead of really being free in Christ. Paul says don't let these things control you. No, let the Spirit of God control you. Be that all-consuming driving force in your life. And what I want to focus on today is what does it look like for a man or woman to be empowered by the Spirit of God and filled with the Holy Spirit. What, what, what does that look like? What does it look like when the driving force behind our life is the Spirit of God? And what I find very interesting, not only in Ephesians, but also in Philippians, uh, that it, is, it, it really is the mark of one who is humble and the one who is a servant and the one who is making less about themselves and more about Christ and therefore more about others. And if we're going to wage war in our society, if we're going to be soldiers for Christ, we've got to do it in the power of the Spirit. And it doesn't mean that we're just peacemakers and, and that everybody's going to love us. We're going to find out today that, that if you're going to be Spirit-filled, chances are you're going to have enemies and, and there's going to be a cross to bear and all of those things. And it might cost you. Matter of fact, it will cost you, but, but man, you can make an impact for the kingdom. And it will make no sense to the natural mind, but to the spiritual person and to the spirit, it will, it will be edifying, it will be encouraging, it will be, give me this, Lord, this is what I want. And so he says, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit. So what does that look like? What I find interesting in verse 21 of that same chapter, he says, submitting to one another in the fear of God. That, that literally you, you become other focused. You, you're so Christ-centered that you care about those that are around you. And it's not just about what you want. It's not just about what you desire. And it's not just about what you think. It, it's really that, that you have a heart for those that are around you. And you do it not because someone deserves it. If you go out and you say, hey, I'm just going to minister to a bunch of people. I'm just going to love on a bunch of people because I feel like they deserve it and I just want to feel better about myself. You're, you're going to be like a bottle rocket or one of these firecrackers that, that are going to, you're just going to last for just a moment. But if your love for others is rooted and grounded in your love for Christ and you are loving others or God is loving others through you, through your devotion to Jesus, you will last. And you will have fruit that will remain because you are abiding in Jesus, John 15. But if it's just about, hey, I just want to minister to a bunch of people and I just have a heart for people, you're not going to last because people are not too lovable long term. Right? We, 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 we all have struggles and we're irritable and we're grumpy and we're self-centered and we're, we're, we're sinners apart from Jesus. But he says, submitting to one another in the fear of God. And if you look at what's happened to the, the, the bedrock of our society, is there is no love for one another no more. There is no more putting others before ourselves. It's, it's, it's give me what I want, when I want it, how I want it, no matter how 
much I have to run over you to get what I want or what I feel like I need or I deserve. I mean, we're living in some, some, some crazy, crazy times. And, and I don't say this to scare you, um, but I really feel in my spirit that if there's not this major repentance that what we've just seen with, with this COVID thing is just, and where we're at now is just a calm before the real storm. I think there is a major, uh, we're under the wrath, the disciplined hand of God. And, and we've been this, headed this way for a while, for a long while. The church, as I said, has no interest of really doing what I'm talking about doing, walking in the power of the Spirit. We, 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 just, we just, you know, give us the benefits of God, give us the blessings of God, but, but don't make us, God, go all in. Society doesn't want anything to do with God. I mean, we could see the, the craziness that, that we're living in right now, and, and, it's, and it's as if the church still is not waking up. I mean, it, there is no change in the church a year or two years previous to where we are now. I mean, we're just headed down the same path. And I mean, look at what's taking place around us. I mean, all the, the warning signs are there. Church, wake up! Learn what it means to walk in the power of the Spirit and wage war being yielded to me and to make an impact for the kingdom. You know, I find it interesting. I was riding down 278, as many of you did as you, you came to church this week. Uh, have, have you noticed the car lots? They're, 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 they're empty. You, you go out to eat and They'll tell you it's going to be a long wait, but yet there's empty tables all around. Why? Because there's nobody that's willing to work. And this is just the precursor of what's to come. And it has to come as long as we as a nation, as a whole, and this isn't a political sermon, by the way. Corruption is, is, is in the heart. I mean, it's in the fabric of who we are. And, and it's on both sides of the aisle. But as long as we, we, we're at this place where we want nothing to do with God and we're making a mockery to his name, we are opening ourselves up for the very disciplined hand of God to come. And we're, we're living in this false sense of reality right now. It's like we, we don't know what to believe except to what we hold dear, and that is the word of God. So the command is to be filled with the Spirit. How, what does that look like? When we put others before ourselves... When we make life about God, therefore God fleshed out to those that are around us instead of it just all about me and what's in it for me. Now what I find very interesting about the book of Ephesians is follow the logic. You were once in darkness, now you're light, right? Be filled with the Spirit, not some substance. Submit to one another, not because people deserve it, but out of the fear of God. What does that look like if you were to drill down a little bit deeper? Wives, submit to your husbands. Uh-oh, he just said the ugly you know, thing that's totally politically incorrect, and, and even the church, nobody wants to hear it, but it's biblical. Wives, submit. Put yourself under the leadership of your husband. Husbands, lead your families. You are the priest of your homes. You will be the ones that will give an account for your family. Husbands, love, cherish your wife. You're like, well, she doesn't deserve it. It doesn't matter. You love, you cherish her because of your love for God. Wives, you submit to your husband, not because he deserves it, but because of your love for God. And by the way, if you're going to change him, you do it through putting others before yourself. You do it through submission. You do it in the power of the Spirit. And it's as if we get ourselves out of the way. The Spirit of God has opportunity and the ability to work in our midst. Instead of us just doing things in our own strength and causing all kind of chaos and, and craziness. You know, there was, I'm going to get myself in trouble with this, but there was a, a day and age that when a woman came close to a door, that, that the man would, would open the door or, or the car door and there would be this, this, this cherishing of the wife. Some things I've, I've got to work on. Um, but, but equally... I was watching an old western just a few months ago, and I told this to my, my, my kids, and they kind of laughed at me, but all, all the kids, it was a big family, and they just stood around the table, and they wouldn't even sit down and begin to, to, to even think about eating dinner, let alone sitting down until the father came in, the patriarch of the home, and, and, and pulled up and sat down, and then they would all sit. I mean, that's like crazy to us, but the level of 
of just revering and understanding those that, that God has placed in those positions of influence and authority over our lives of, of how we interact with one another and how it reflects our relationship with God. For, for some that, that are not from the South, yes sir and, and yes ma'am, it's not just Southern hospitality that's becoming a lost art. It's really that of revering and respect for those that God has put over us. It's like all of those things, they're just out the window to where there, there's, there's no respect at home. There, there's no respect uh, for anybody that holds any type of positions of authority, period. And I realize that there has been much corruption that has eroded much of that. But remember, as believers, we don't do it because people deserve it. We do it because of our love and devotion to God. When you get to chapter 6, Paul says, Children, obey your parents. It's the mark of being a spirit-filled child. Or bond servants, be obedient to your masters. It's equivalent to the employer-employee relationship. You do what's right. Not because they're just looking at you, but because of the fact that you do what's right, because that's just who you are as a person, because of your love for Jesus. Our lives should be so radically different that the workforce should line up in droves designed to hire believers. Because our ethic, our work is so radically different, and our demeanor and how we treat one another is so different than the world. But as I said at the beginning of our time, the, the church has lost the understanding of what it means to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And there is no difference, by and large, between the church and the world. The sexual immorality in the world is the same thing that's showing up in the church. I mean, the average young person today thinks it's cool not to identify with a certain gender in which they were created. By the way, this whole attack on the gender, and there's only two, male and female, God created them, the Bible makes that clear, is really an attack on God because He created us in His image. And it will not only get you in trouble, it will get you downright. A war started towards you by speaking the very things that I'm speaking in the public square. So, if we're going to be spirit-filled, we got to get over self. we got to adopt this mindset of humility and service. But we're going to see today, it's going to cost us. If everybody likes you and speak well, speaks well of you, and, and, and everybody thinks you hung the moon, that's probably a telltale sign you're not walking and living in the spirit. But equally, we're not marked by a bunch of arrogance, just, just going around starting fires and wars for the sake of doing it because of our own ego. And by the way, what, wasn't that Jesus? Power, humility, but yet servant's heart and all about doing the will of the Father. I was reading through an old pastor's uh, sermon this week from the 1800s and, and as I was reading through his, his sermon, it was on prayer. He said, if, if you think of a ladder and climbing the rung of, of the ladder, he says the highest rung you can reach in prayer as far as in growing in your prayer is to pray the prayer that Jesus prayed, God, not my will, but thy will be done. Thy will. And most of the stuff that we war over and we fight and we struggle with even with God is that we want our will instead of really His. And so, going to the book of Philippians, we're going to start in verse 5, but I want to quote to you verse 4. Not only look out for your interests, but also the interests of others. In essence, when we become God-focused and empowered by the Spirit of God, then we're naturally going to care about those that are around us. Those of the household of faith and those that we are longing to come to faith in Jesus Christ. I hope that you will or you are praying daily for your family, 
Fathers, you should be taking your family before the throne of grace every single day wrestling in prayer against the evil one because he desires to destroy them and you should be serving your families in such a way that you are refusing to give up on them and laboring before the throne for God's will to be done in their lives. You become other focused. Not only for those that God's given us to be a part of our particular fold, that we're shepherding, and we're all called to shepherd at some level, but you should be praying daily, asking God to give you someone to minister to. Someone that doesn't know Jesus that you could be used to bringing close to Him. Someone who's destined for hell that could be brought into to, to God's um, kingdom. Or someone that is far from God, maybe a believer, but just struggling that needs to be brought back, a lost sheep. Whatever it may be. But my prayer is that you are praying that daily. God, give me someone. I don't want to be barren. Help me to be fruitful for the kingdom. You are so Christ-centered that you have no choice but to become other-focused. Who is it, Lord? Who is it that the Spirit is working on their hearts that need to hear the glorious truth of the Gospel? Who is it, God, that I can be a witness to? Who is it, God, that I can slow down and that I can be used as a vessel to bring to Jesus? Or at least encourage. Now, you know why most of us don't pray those prayers? is because prayer is a dangerous thing. And when you pray kingdom-focused, kingdom-minded prayers... You will not pray them without it costing you something. It always does. And so this brings us to the very point of the message. That if we're going to walk in the power of the Spirit, then we've got to have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. Paul's writing to the church at Philippi, and he, he's wanting them to understand the joy that, that they have in the Lord, and, and he's talking about... Timothy and Ephrodite that have gone all in and put others before themselves. And he's like, this, this is what it means to have the mind of Christ. He's also going to talk about two ladies in the church. Maybe they're working in the kitchen or singing in the choir. I, I don't know what it is, but they can't get along. And he's like, some of you got to come alongside them and help them because you got to have the mind of Christ. In essence, it's all rooted back in, into this. this. This To me, this is what it means to be spirit-filled. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Verse 4, don't think just of yourself, but think of others. Let this mind, let this mindset, let this attitude. Some of your translations will say something along the lines of the same attitude that Jesus had towards others, so should you. Adopt this same mindset. And it should be our hearts cry, God, give us this mindset, give us this mind of Christ to where we can literally offer ourselves out, we can pour ourselves out on the altar for your namesake, for your glory. If you want to know what, as your pastor, I was praying for you this week was this very thing. God, give this congregation, give this, this flock, this people, the mind of Christ. Give them a hunger for it. Teach them to walk in it. That they may adopt the same mindset that Jesus has. And if the Spirit's going to produce His life in us, we're going to have the mind of Christ. And we're going to be other focused. He said, well, what, is, what does that look like? Well, well, notice what verse 6 says. Who being in the form of God did not consider robbery to be equal with God, verse 7 says, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant, coming and coming in the likeness of man. And so, when Paul says, have this mindset, have this, this, this attitude, this outlook, this way of life that Jesus had, when we draw close to God, we ask the Spirit to fill us. He's going to produce this in our lives. And this is what it looks like. Think, think about this. Who being, verse 6, in the form of God, did not consider robbery or something to grasp to or hold on to to be equal with God. Jesus who enjoyed well before Bethlehem because he's God, he's just as much God as God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, has always existed, enjoyed the splendor and the glory of heaven, pre-Bethlehem and eternity past. But yet, 
because of our state as humanity, broken, dead to the things of God, separated from God, did not cling to that glory, but was willing to make himself of no reputation or, or kenosis, to empty himself. Not that he ever ceased to be God, but he was willing to set that glory, so to speak, aside. Clothe himself in humanity, coming in the likeness of man for the purpose of redeeming you and I. And so here's the thought. The Spirit develops this mindset of going all in. And in that, if we're going to walk in the Spirit, here's what it's going to look like. Number one, we're going to have to be willing to have a little skin in the game and to give up whatever that is in order to fulfill the will of God. This mindset that you're going to be filled with the Spirit of God, you're going to be used by God to reach people, and it isn't going to cost you anything, it isn't going to inconvenience you, you're going to have to give up some stuff, is nonsense. It's going to cost you. It may even cost you your life. But it's definitely going to cost you your comfort. It may cost you your reputation. It's certainly going to cost you your time. You're certainly going to be inconvenienced. But it's going to cost you something because it always does. And I love the fact that Jesus was willing to leave all the glory of heaven, all the worship that was taking place by the angelic host, all the splendor. We can't even wrap our minds around what is taking place right now before the very throne of grace, around the very throne room itself. And yet Jesus was willing to step out of that into the likeness of, of sinful man. The glory was, was, was veiled. It. He left the throne room of heaven, what, to become part of creation. Despised, rejected. Matter of fact, notice what Isaiah 53 says. And we, we love Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 5. It says that he was despised and he was rejected by men. A man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as, as it were, our faces from him because why? He was despised and we did not esteem him. This is the God of, of, of the universe. And surely he's borne our grief, our pain. He's carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. And the chastisement for our peace was upon him. And it was by his stripes we were healed. Do you think Jesus had skin in the game? Of course he did. And so if you say, Lord, fill me with the Spirit. Lord, do, you know, take all of me. Do not think that you're going to do that from the place of comfort. It's going to cost you. You're going to have to give some things up. And I think that's why Jesus says, whoever wants to come after me, let him take up his cross, deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And I will remind you, it is right here where many people in the church today will turn their ears off, so to speak, and say, I've heard enough. Give me the blessings, give me all the benefits, but give me the comfort as well. I don't want to go to that next level. If you ever expect to be used by God in any, any, any way, then you've got to be willing to say, God, whatever. Nothing's off limits. Here I am. Nothing's off limits. For most of us, we can't even get up in the morning to consistently meet with God just to hear from Him, let alone give something up. We don't want to give our sleep up. And I'm not saying that to browbeat you. I'm just saying we do what's important to us, and we haven't gotten to the place the vast majority of Christians in, in America to the place where God's most important. So, you got to be willing to give something up, and if your spirit feels, I, I guarantee you, it's costing you something. Notice number the second thing, though, is that we have to view ourselves as slaves. Back in, in Philippians, Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, that he was, even though he was in the um, he was with, with God, who 
being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal to God, made himself of no reputation, taken on the form of a bondservant. So get this. If, if you want to be empowered by the Spirit, you want the anointing of God to be upon your life, you want to go all in, you want to be used by God, you want to shake the nation for the kingdom of God, then you got to go all in. And if you go all in, you got to have skin in the game. It's going to cost you something. But do not re- see yourself as being this great, you know, Leader that people are going to bow down to. No, see yourself as a servant. As a foot washer. As a professional foot washer. This goes against the natural mind completely. That, that's beneath me. Well, I remind you, it was not beneath our Lord. And you will never be able to serve people to the level that God desires for you to be able to, to penetrate losses and serve people if you do not see yourself as a slave and a bondservant. It's absolutely remarkable to me that, that most of the epistles that open up in the New Testament, they open up with bondservant, slave. Jesus said very clearly in the gospel, he said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom. The reason the church doesn't have any power is we're too full of ourselves. Culturally speaking, the more people we have to pamper us, the more we feel like we've arrived. But from a spiritual standpoint and a kingdom standpoint, that's baloney. Serving. Pouring our lives out. Investing. Go back to the husband. Go back to the wife. Go back to the children. What we talked about in Ephesians in the opening of this message. At the heart of that, if if you're going to be spirit-led, you're going to pour your lives out. I love what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.22. He says, I become all things to all men that I might, might by all means save some. Paul didn't walk around as this high and mighty apostle. No, he, he saw himself as nothing. He would say in Philippians, when speaking to the Jewish heritage, he will list, I mean, his, his pedigree, so to speak. And he says, you know what, it's all skabala, it's all hogwash, dung, it's, it's nothing. That's what I think about it. He says, I, I, don't, I, I don't care to know anything except Christ and Christ crucified. He says, I'm going to boast anything, I'm going to boast in the cross. You know, a servant doesn't boast about their degrees. A servant doesn't boast about what's in their bank account, what kind of car they drive. No, a servant boasts in Christ and Christ alone and how he or she can be used by God to minister. Now, can God use all of those things or any of those things bad in and of itself? Of course not. But it all has to be viewed through the cross. You've got to view yourself as a slave. And then thirdly, and maybe this is the, the most important point out of them all, is that he came in the likeness of, of man, the likeness of sinful man. Was he sinful? Of course not. He was perfect. He's God in the flesh, but, but he, he humbled himself down and became part of his creation. So much you go back to what we just read in Isaiah 53. He, he didn't just say, hey, I'm God and, and you are a bunch of peasants out here that are, are, are dirty and you stink and you're wicked and I detest you and, and I'm going to love you from a distance and you can't get like real close to me. That, that isn't how our Lord went about the redemption process. He was born to what we would call modern day peasants. He humbled himself down. Him down. He, he walked through everything that we could possibly imagine. He knows what it's like to even be betrayed and spit on. He identified with our sorrow and our pain. He came in the likeness of man. So what is that? What is this third point? If, if what it looks like to be spirit-filled is one, not only is it going to cost us something, we're giving some stuff up, namely our comfort. Not only are we seeing ourselves as servants, but, but here's the third one. 
We are identifying with those that are around us. Many times the Lord will allow us to walk through some excruciating tough times to give us a heart and a platform to be able to minister to those that have walked through some of the very same things. But if we don't think that we're going to be able to that we're going to be able to minister and not identify, you're sadly mistaken. And what I find interesting is that, that he struggled, Christ, the Pharisees, scribes, why? Because they were too full of themselves. But the tax collectors, the publicans, the, you know, the sinners, the outcasts, the, those, those guys, those are the ones that were saying, I, I want to hang out with them. I, I want to be near to him. Now, he brought transformation in their life. You say, what is the answer for this nation? I'll give you the answer. It's you. But it's not you in and of yourself. It's he who's living in you. And it's asking the Spirit of God to fill you and in that inconvenience you to make you a professional foot washer, servant, slave. Well, if, if I do that, it, it may cost me. Oh, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you. Well, that doesn't even make sense. It doesn't make sense to the natural mind. But this is how God works. Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Obedient without any limitations. Final point. As I've said many times before in my own personal prayer time, I'm reading through the journals of Jim Elliott. And what fascinates me about this man of God, David Brainer was the same way. Yet another, they, they had kindred spirits. Both of these men died at a very early age. One through martyrdom, one through sickness. But the Lord carried them home. But, but man, the, these young guys, they knew what it meant to call heaven down to earth. They knew what it meant to walk with Jesus. They were willing to forsake all. And they, they, longed, they wanted the world to have no hold on them. God, I am all in for you. They were longing for the kingdom. They were longing for that city. And by the way, the closer you get with Jesus, the more you develop this mindset, the less this world will have a hold on you. Because everything that I, I'm, I'm mentioning here is about letting go of the world. But Elliot just fascinates me because in his early 20s, in college getting up in the wee hours of the morning to read Scripture, to meditate on Scripture, to, to commune with God. He is asking God that if, if he needs to spill his blood for the gospel, for people to come to be saved, do it. Almost as if he was longing for, for, for his martyrdom. He's like, what, what are you thinking? And if you know his story, him and the, the other uh, missionary companions that, that went and they ministered to this lost tribe that, that did not know who, who Christ was, they ended up giving their life for, for the gospel. And from the natural mind, you're like, well, what a waste. He had a little girl and a wife, and he never got to see her grow old. He didn't get to see his grandchildren, the whole nine yards. But the spiritual man said, no, not a waste. What a gain. It was through his wife, Elizabeth, and, and the other missionaries' wives that went to that group after his blood, and their blood was spilt, that reached that group with the gospel. And how many countless of missionaries and, and young believers throughout our generation was inspired by his story, says, God, if you can do it there, do it again, do it in my life. Matter of fact, you study the history of the church, it's when the blood of the saints begin to spill on the ground that the church comes alive and gets on fire for God. You're like, oh, it's like, preacher, you, you just gone crazy. But it's true. It's when you start preaching like this that, that the young men and women line up and say, God, do it again, do it in me. Because their walk with God is so real and the power of the Spirit is resonating and moving in their life in such a way this world has no hold on them. 
It is almost as if they could see and they could taste that city that Abraham was talking about. And you would think that as many people that we've already buried, as much as this life has yielded no good gain to us as far as eternal significance, and everything that we think is going to deliver ends up short except that of Jesus, that we would get to the point and say, God, do it again. Do it in us. Now, God may cause you to live for another 50 to 60 years, but He may ask you to go all in for Him. And the question is, will you? Because if we have the mind of Christ, it will cost us something. We will see ourselves as slaves. We will identify with those that are broken and those that the Spirit of God is, is, is moving in, that He's calling to Himself, that we may see them come to faith, and that our obedience has to be so great that there is no limitations. No matter where He calls, no matter where He leads, we will follow. It says that He humbled Himself and became obedient even to the point of death. The death of the cross. I don't know about you, but to the natural mind, the cross didn't make a whole lot of sense. But to the spiritual mind, it makes much sense. Now, if that leaves you a little beside yourself, just come back next week because we're going to get in the following verse that has the therefore. And whatever God asks us to do that costs us greatly, there's always a therefore. God's going to show up. You see, there, there, there's a crown because of the death and the cross. I mean, he's, he's always sat on the throne, but he's redeemed humanity. We all want, want the crown, but you aren't going to have the crown without the cross. You want to be the Savior, you've got to be willing to give your life. And once you do that, God shows up in a mighty way. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Don't just look out for your interests, but also the interests of others. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to close in prayer. Praising, they're going to come back up. We're going to sing Blessed Assurance. I'm going to challenge you during this time of reflection, this invitation, to stand in the gap. Stand in the gap for your family, for this nation, for those that you know that are far from Christ. And would you be willing to say, God, fill me with your spirit and use me to reach them with the gospel. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this worship time together this morning in your house, in this place. And Lord, as we're going to stand and we're going to sing praises to your name, as we're going to worship you through song, may your people equally worship through prayer as they pray and as they intercede for the lostness around us, for the church, that we can make an impact for your name's sake. For we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.